Dr. Seuss wrote for many years because the cat in the hat was old when I was born, and I was born way before 1992. Amen? Don't, don't answer that one with amen. <laughs> my goodness gracious me, oh my. Um, but it speaks, I think, to what Jesus is saying to the disciples today. He's saying, get out into the world and do what you're called to do because it's going to be up to you to do things. What does Jesus look for? We've heard it in the gospel lesson. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We could be singing, bring in the sheaves, bring in the sheaves, but that's an oldie today. We're not going to do that one today. So we're focusing on young folks and dads and grads and men and women too, because we're focusing on discipleship. So we need shepherds, apparently, as well, because Jesus has compassion on them because they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So if sheep without a shepherd, you need a shepherd, right? Shepherd is the word that means pastor. Pastor means shepherd. Then um, what else does Jesus need? Oh, he needs exorcists. Has anybody here ever cast out a demon? Raise your hand if you've cast out a demon, because I'd like to speak with you after this service, please. What else do they need? People to cure the sick. Anybody here ever cured the sick? You really have when you pray for people, you cure the sick. We had a doctor here, a medical doctor this morning. She has cured people, I'm sure. Not maybe miraculously, but you've cured people and brought people health. We pray for people and they get better sometimes, don't they? Raise the dead. Anybody here ever raise the dead? I really want to talk to you after the service if that's you. Jesus has all sorts of work to be done, doesn't he? And he calls us to those jobs. But I think if you put them all, if you look at the sermon title that I forgot to bring the slide for this morning, it is God's looking for what? Servant leaders. Who knows what a servant leader is? Anybody know where that came from, that, that idea of being a servant leader? It didn't come from the church, after all. It came from business. It was, um, the phrase was coined only in 1970. Some of us were alive then by a man named Robert Greenleaf in an essay called Servant Leadership, or The Servant as Leader. This is what he wrote. The servant leader is servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. Then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. That person is sharply different than the one who is leader first, perhaps because of the need to assuage an unusual power driver to acquire material possessions. The leader first and servant first are two extreme types. Between them are the shadings and blends that are part of the infinite variety of human nature. The difference manifests itself in the care given by the servant first to make sure that other people's highest priority needs are being served. The best tests are difficult to administer. Do those served grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? And what is the effect on the least privileged in society? Will they benefit or at least not be further deprived? That's what a servant leader is. Also what a disciple is, don't you think? We're called to minister to the harassed and helpless. Anybody here ever feel harassed in life? Anybody here ever feel helpless in life? I felt helpless with the number of deaths that we've experienced lately. My mother's just less than a month ago. And Bill Brown is on a plane, or might be landing now in Texas, for his father-in-law's funeral. His father-in-law, who died literally less than four hours after his own father died in Pennsylvania. Bill's father-in-law died in Texas. Michelle and Tori were there. Bill was here in Maryland. It's incomprehensible, isn't it, to think about losing two fathers so close to Father's Day. I feel helpless against death sometimes. I feel helpless. I feel harassed sometimes. Anybody here ever been heckled during a sermon? I have. I've had people yell at me during sermons. What are you talking about, woman? Things like that. Weird stuff can happen when you're proclaiming Jesus Christ. Maybe that's what Dr. Seuss meant when he continued to write. Let me get to the right place. I already did it. You won't lag behind because you'll have the speed. You'll pass the whole gang. You'll soon take the lead. Wherever you fly, you'll be best of the best. Wherever you go, you will top all the rest, except when you don't, because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say, but sadly it's true that bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. Maybe you ever have a bang-up or a hang-up when you felt harassed or helpless? That brings us to our man Moses in Exodus this morning. 
Moses, the ultimate servant leader, right? How was he called? What, how did God speak to Moses? Through what vehicle? Through what thing? A burning bush, a bush that was on fire but did not get consumed. What did God say to him from the bush? Moses, Moses, take off your shoes of the holy ground you're standing on. What else did God say? I've seen my people suffering. I understand their suffering, and I've come down to deliver them. Now, here's what you do, Moses. You go and you tell the Pharaoh, and Moses is like, wait, 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 wait. He said, I stutter a little bit. God, I can't do that for you. God says, well, take your brother. He'll talk for you. And then Moses has that ultimate question, that arrogant question, that audacious question. He says, whom shall I say sent me? And God says, I am who I am. And Moses goes then, doesn't he? I love this passage because Moses has been speaking with God. He's entering the wilderness of Sinai. People are camped at the mountain. Moses goes up, he talks to God. And then God says, this is what you're going to tell the house of Jacob and all the Israelites, da 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 So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. The people answered as one, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Let's say that together. Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Ha! I think probably the next line will be, and then God laughed. Amen? Does God know that we're not going to do everything we say we're going to do? But still God calls us, doesn't he? Doesn't God call us to works of the Spirit, works of helping those who are shepherdless, who are harassed and helpless, those who are sick, those who have unclean spirits, those who are just suffering from a lack of hopefulness. And these are the names of the 12 apostles. How many of you could name all 12 disciples? Can anybody here do it without looking at them? I can, not because I went to seminary, but because I went to vacation Bible school. Here's a plug for vacation Bible school. Anybody know the song? There were 12 disciples. Jesus called to help him. Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, his brother, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas, and Bartholomew. You should have seen me in my New Testament class when I had to name him on a test. Like, <laughs> That's where I learned those. But what does it say about these disciples? What do you know about Thaddeus? Anybody know anything about Thaddeus? What about Bartholomew? We know about Simon Peter, don't we? Simon who was called Peter. He was the rock that... Jesus said, I'll build my church on that rock, and that rock let him down a couple of times along the way, don't you think? But what does it say here? It names, it just, it names them all, but it says, Matthew, Matthew the tax collector. Dum, dum, dum. Bad thing to be a tax collector in those days. Because that meant he colluded with Rome against his own people. Then we have Simon the Cananean, meaning he was not from our part of town. And then Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him how they're known, but without those 12 men, would we be here today? No, we would not. We don't have to know their whole background. We don't have to know what they did. We have to know that they followed Jesus. They said yes, and they were servant leaders. And every last one of them, according to tradition, we don't have it in the Holy Scriptures, not in the canon of Scripture, but every last one of them ended up sacrificing his life for the gospel, gladly and willingly, because the Holy Spirit had taken hold of them and changed them into these bold men, they were no longer fishermen and tax collectors. They were apostles, the ones who talked and walked with Jesus, the ones who did what he asked them to do. You don't have to be Moses. You don't have to be Martin Luther King Jr. You don't have to be anybody particular or powerful. You just have to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. When's the last time anybody here shared the gospel of Jesus Christ outside of this building? Anybody have a story to tell? Mine was just yesterday in Wise Market in Reisterstown. I couldn't reach everything I wanted for breakfast today was on the top shelf. And some of you know I sit here in my little wheelie cart because I cannot reach up because I have a frozen shoulder because I fell and broke it last summer. And I couldn't reach something. And I asked the man who worked there, I said, could you help me get this down, please? And he was about as tall as me. And he looked at me like, wow, you must really be pathetic. I told him I said I have a frozen shoulder. And he said, Okay, let me get that for you. And he got it done. And you know what he said to me? He said, your shoulder's going to get better. I know it will because God is going to heal you. It's a powerful witness, isn't it, from somebody I never knew. I said, amen to that. And he said, are you a believer? I said, yes, I am. And we talked a little bit about our faith in the grocery store. 
But there are people who don't know about hope. They don't know that there's someone who can shepherd them, who can pass through them along the way, who can be with them in their worst moments, someone who can cure their diseases and drive out their spirits. And I don't think evil spirits are what cause mental illness or things like that today. What we know now is, as a seizure disorder, epilepsy was once thought about being possessed by a demon. We know that God controls all of human life, and God can help us to heal. Heal our hearts when they're broken, heal our bodies when they're broken, heal our shoulders when they're broken and frozen. God can do these things for us. We've got to believe. We've got to share the story of Jesus Christ. Now, God said that the through Jesus, that the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Um, 2011, when the state of Georgia cracked down on undocumented migrant workers, this is what happened. Anybody ever been to a migrant camp? I did in West Virginia once when we took food there. It was a cinder block box of a building, no screens in the windows, no doors on the doorway and one toilet for about 38 people in this building. But they worked hard. And a friend that I went to school with, or knew right after school, I can't remember if I knew him then or not, but um, his name is Ira Barr. He retired this year at conference. His father owned an orchard, and he said, you cannot get an American person to pick an apple. Because what happens in August and September when the apples start to get ripe? What else is buzzing around in the orchards? Yellow jackets. They're the meanest of bees. They sting you just to sting you sometimes. And they're attracted to that sweet fruit as it starts to rot on the vine or if it gets really ripe. And he said, people see the first snake hanging in a tree or they're stung once and he says they're out of there. They come in, he said you could pay them three or four times what you pay a migrant worker, but they're not going to stay and not going to work because they aren't one of, they're not willing to put up those working conditions. So, in Georgia in 2011, when the state cracked down on um, undocumented migrant workers, people stopped going to Georgia to pick their crops, and guess how much money was lost? $75 million. $75 million worth of food rotted in the fields because of that. Now, Jesus is sending us to a different kind of harvest of people. What happens to those people if we're not there to harvest the fruit of God? What happens to the people who never hear the good news of Jesus Christ? What happens to the people who don't know that there's hope in the world, that they're loved, that they're forgiven, that they've got peace that's unequal to anything they could even imagine? What happens to them if we're not telling them the story? We know these 12, whatever they did, whatever Thaddeus and Bartholomew did that we don't hear about in Scripture, we know they did it because we're here today. We're here today because somebody loved us and to tell us the good news of Jesus Christ and invite us to church with them. That's why we're here. So we're either going to let people rot in the field or die alone or we're going to be with them in their troubles. Now, Dr. Seuss ends his poem this way. It is a poem because everything he writes rhymes. Even he has to make up a word, it rhymes. You'll get mixed up, of course, as you already know. You'll get mixed up with many strange birds as you go. So be sure when you step, step with care and great tact, and remember that life's a great balancing act. Never forget to be dexterous and deft, and never mix up your right foot with your left. And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. Ninety-eight and three-quarter percent guaranteed. Kid, you'll move mountains. So be your name Bucksbaum or Bixby or Bray, or Mordecai Ali Van Allen O'Shea. You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Isn't that what Jesus is saying to us? Literally, he said, you'll move mountains. That comes from his mouth to our ears, to the ears of his people. So Aiden and Brian, you're going to move mountains. You're going to move mountains. You will. But it's time for all of us to get on our way. Whether you're a dad or a grad or a man or a woman, whether you're five years old or 50 or 112, you're a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he wants you to go out into the world in his name to bring others to his truth and his peace and his love. Amen, amen, and amen. Let us sing together. <laughs>